Howdy guys. Welcome back to Alec 618, where we are starting our kind of second full week on team development, looking at storming. So you have conquered forming, right? You've got that down, talking about group norms, understanding team development roles, um, really looking at the process and the impact of culture within team when you're making those first very crucial steps. To me, um, and again, one of the reasons I love Tuckman is that this next stage of storming is what I call the real world of teams. So for those that are old enough to have lived through it the first time or have seen reruns on maybe YouTube or something like that, the real world was one of MTV's first reality TV shows. And their tagline was when people stop being nice and start being real. And to me, that's teams, right? Forming is when we're still trying to be nice with each other. We're still trying to figure out what's going on and who's going to take the lead in certain areas. And storming is when we actually start being real. And one of the, I guess, really team effectiveness models is the best way to say it when it talks about storming and kind of conflict specifically is this five dysfunctions of a team. So Patrick Lucioni is the author of this model. It's a book. So, and it's a really, I would say, easy read type of a team leadership book. I want it's not quite airport because it is based on uh some research, so it's not like crazy just pop leadership, but um, it's an easy read. So it's a good one to to run through. If you are having team problems, this is a great place to start to try to figure out what's actually going on with your team. So that's why I thought this would be great to start off our kind of module on storming. I'm beeping. What's going on? There we go. All right. So this five dysfunctions of the team. And if you look at this triangle, for those of you that have taken leadership classes before or classes on motivation or learning, triangles are something that um, we love as educators and as leadership people. Um, the most famous triangle, I would think, would be Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so what Maslow's presence is, is that those basic needs there at the bottom, um, Really, if you don't have those, you can't go up the triangle. Lincioni kind of takes that same approach, and he says that the linchpin of team effectiveness is trust. So if you do not have trust within your team, there's no way you can get to the pinnacle of team development or team effectiveness, which is actually accomplishing your goal. So when we look through this, the absence of trust for Lincioni is that you need to be vulnerable with your team. So if you are have invulnerability, you've got this absence of trust. With conflict and the fear of conflict, sometimes this looks like artificial harmony. So we talk about norming in the next module. It's very much that same of, yeah, everything's great, everything's fine. And then really, you know, it's not. Um, but the fear of conflict happens because we don't trust each other. So if we don't trust each other, we can't engage in healthy conflict, which then leads to this next one, which is lack of commitment. So if you are, if you don't trust your teammates, if you don't, feel like your voice can be heard and so you're internalizing all that conflict, then that's going to lead you to a lack of commitment within your team. And this looks like ambiguity, right? Where are we actually going? What are we actually doing? Do I even care anymore? So that's that stage. And when after, after that, I guess, dysfunction comes to this idea of avoidance of accountability, you peace out. Like you, you shoot on the peace sign, you walk out the door and you're just like, you know what? I'm going to do what bare minimum, whatever it takes to get by, but I'm not going to go above and beyond. And this is a problem because then we are just hitting low bars. We're not going above the bars. We're not meeting and exceeding expectations. We're just doing minimum in order to stay around. Then if that's going on, what's going to happen is that your team project will not come to fruition, right? It will not be as good as it possibly could because you're not paying attention to those results. And a lot of that happens because individual status and ego gets in the way. It becomes about me instead of we. 
And if you've ever had a team experience like that, where you start off with the we, we're gonna go do this, we're gonna make this happen, we are the ones that did this. And then when it gets to the top, if it has become so dysfunctional, you have that one person who tries to maybe take credit for it and it becomes a me situation, not a collective situation, which is very dysfunctional when it comes to teamwork. And I think one of the interesting things about Licioni is he says that teamwork remains an elusive act in organizations. Isn't that a great quote? An elusive act because we often fall into one of these five pitfalls of teams. So let's break this down a little bit as we go through. So what is the absence of trust? So Lincioni defines trust in this way. Trust is the confidence among team members that their peers' intentions are good, right? Do we automatically see the best in our team or do we automatically assume the worst? And those assumptions really influence trust. So when and, and I know that you guys have experienced this. When you lose trust with someone, right? It takes a second to lose trust with someone, but it takes a lifetime to rebuild it. So if trust is not there, if you've lost that, then it's just going to disseminate your team, or not disseminate, disintegrate your team. So when there's an absence of trust in a team, you have no reason to be protective of each other You have no reason to be careful about your actions. Do your actions match your words, match your values, right? There's no incentive to be an authentic leader. There's no incentive to fulfill that group member role that you have, which is very problematic. So how do we kind of deal with this? Well, we have to get comfortable with being real. We have to get comfortable with saying, I'm not going to overpromise and underdeliver. If you ask me to do something in a team and it's not something I'm good at, I have to be vulnerable enough to say, no, I'm really bad at that. Right? I, I can't do that. Or it's going to take me longer because that's not a strength. When you're true and honest and vulnerable with those around you, you're going to build trust. Now, I've been having some problems with um, YouTube. I know our team development lecture, it wouldn't load on YouTube because of our clips. So I wanted to put this link up here for you that you could take a look at. Um, The queen of vulnerability is Brene Brown, right? And so Brene's TED Talk, her I guess really second TED talk that she put up about vulnerability is just perfect for this. So what does vulnerability look like? How can we engage with it and others? And how is it a strength, not a weakness? So when you have a second, take a look at that um, because it's just so good. So being completely open and honest, if you don't have past experience, that's great. Tell people if you've got some baggage when it comes to something, tell people, right? So what does this look like for a team? So in a team with a trust absence, so when this is a dysfunction of your team, people will conceal their weaknesses, right? They're not going to be open and honest. They're going to hide things. They're going to um, not tell somebody when they screw up. They're going to try to cover it up instead of being open about it. Um, You know, again, from an ethics perspective, oh boy, this leads down a really rough road. If you don't trust your teammates, you're not going to ask for help. And that could be, again, very detrimental to the team end up project. Sometimes you hold grudges when there's a trust issue. Um, If you haven't let it go, pulled an Elsa from Frozen and let it go, um, you're holding all that bitterness in. Um, I don't know who actually said this quote. It's, it's attributed to Carrie Fisher. I've seen it attributed to a lot of different people. But when you are bitter against someone else, it's like swallowing poison and expecting the other person to die. It only hurts you, right? They're living rent-free in your head. They don't know they're living there. They don't care. But grudges are so detrimental for a team. So again, better to have that trust and be able to take care of that conflict, which we'll get to in a second. Teams that have an absence of trust waste time and energy tiptoeing around each other. 
and I know you've experienced this and you probably have some really great stories. This is what I hate about online classes because we could have such great conversations about how we've experienced this within a team. Um, but it's a time waster. It's an energy suck, right? With trust, so teams that have a good basis of trust are willing to admit their weaknesses and mistakes and move forward, right? It's so much easier to clean up a mistake when it's fresh than when it's sat there for a long time. It's like a stain on a carpet. Those that are really good with trust in a team, they'll be able to ask for help because they have that vulnerability piece. They give each other the benefit of the doubt. So again, it's that idea of assuming the best about your teammates, not the worst. You're more likely to take risks, right? Because you know if you fail, it's not the end of the world. Your teammates will be there to help you pick up the pieces if it goes completely wrong. Those teams with trust tap into one another's skills and experiences. They use group member roles most effectively in order to engage in those um, up the pyramid for Lincioni, right? But really to achieve team goals. And they focus their time and energy on the important things, not wasting it on tiptoeing around each other, of trying to figure out how to deal with each other. They're actually putting their efforts towards the end product. And what's interesting when it comes to this idea of trust, that most people who are successful in the workplace, they're competitive, right? They're going to be the type A. They're going to be the ones that are driven. And sometimes that need to drive and exceed and excel actually makes them do whatever it takes to protect their reputation. They don't want to seem like they're fallible. They want to seem infallible. And so that actually is a trust deterrent when that happens because it's hard to show vulnerability when you have put yourself on a pedestal, right? So that's what makes a really high effective, high functioning team full of superstars almost honestly even harder to deal with when it comes to um, to trust and vulnerability. So our next dysfunction, this idea of fear of conflict. Again, here's a fun YouTube for you to, to look at. Um, this is I, going back to good old Sesame Street. Conflict is an issue, and this is the two-headed monsters and Robin Williams talking about conflict. It's hard, right? Conflict is very difficult to deal with. And so when we think about conflict, um, many times it's, con it's considered something taboo, right? We're not going to show any disagreement. We need a united front. You may have heard that so many times. Um, but conflict actually helps us get to a better place. Now you have to distinguish between productive conflict and destructive fighting. And there's a sweet spot. So when it starts being personal, then it is destructive. When it's about an idea, when it's about systematic issues, when it's about a process, then it is productive. But then when it switch and starts getting ugly, then it absolutely just becomes destructive fighting. It's healthy conflict is a time saver. Unhealthy conflict is a time waster. So when we think about this, there's lots of benefits. I know you're going to be like, what? There's benefits of conflict in a team. I promise you. So one of these is increasing energy levels, which is very cool. So it actually engages people to deal with situations in a better way. It changes the low energy conflict into something that is more high energy of deeper thinking, more critical thinking. It's very cool. Those that can engage in productive conflict in te teams have greater creativity within their team. Again, this all makes sense, right? It adds depth to discussions because people are not afraid to say what they truly think or talk about their experiences because they're not afraid that it's going to shut down the team. Right? Hey, you know what? You have a difference in opinion. Great. Let's talk through this. What have been your been your lived experiences with this? And it actually produces more effective 
and often more efficient solutions to the problem because you can work through some of those little issues. So fear of, te- of conflict, what does that look like in a team? I know you're going to think this one's kind of stupid, um, but boring meetings, right? You go in, you do your thing. No one is actually saying what they're thinking. Everyone is just sitting there stewing in their own anger. That's boring, right? It's anxiety driven. We don't like meetings like that. What happens after those boring meetings? (laughs) Back channel politics and personal attacks. So as soon as you walk out of that meeting and you go into your office, and I don't know if you've ever had this happen uh, to you, but you're in your office after this meeting, you're frustrated. You're like, God, why can't we just make this happen? And then someone goes, hey, do you have a sec? And they walk in your door and then they shut the door. And you know, oh yeah, it's on now, right? So that can either be somebody working an angle, trying to get you to their perceived side, or it could just be someone else that's frustrated and they just want to vent. Can you believe Steve did this? He's a jerk, right? And then, whew, Boy, then it goes downhill and becomes absolutely uh, unproductive conflict. Those that have a fear of conflict ignore controversial topics. No one is going to hit those hot button topics because no one wants to be nowadays canceled. Um, No one wants to have that. Well, I don't agree with with your opinion because of this. Um, So we just tiptoe around those things. And when that happens, we actually can have some pretty bad um, issues, right? If no one's actually addressing the the controversial topics and it uh, fail, not tail, ah, fail to tap into all opinions. Now in higher education, I will tell you one of the pitfalls of a hierarchy of um, people, and this really, I think, is is in any organization, but in higher education specifically, um, looking at, let's say you are an assistant professor, right? The people in the room, let's say we're having a, a, a faculty meeting, the people in the room who are associate and professor level will vote on your tenure and promotion. So, so many assistant professors, heck, associate professors even because of the same reason feel muzzled because they don't want to say anything that's going to make those who are voting on their tenure and promotion angry they don't want to be that person they don't want to be called uncollegial and so a lot of times there is silence from associate and assistant professors because they don't the absence of trust, right? So shows into this conflict when maybe they have a very different and valid perspective that needs to be heard. I've seen really great department heads have um, rank only meetings. So only assistant professors, only assistant lecturers go to this one meeting, then associates have their own and then fools have their own. And then this uh, particular department head, she combined all of the Um, statements from all levels sent it then out in a document and said this is what and doesn't didn't say like assistant professors think this and associate professors think this she put it all in a document that showed these are our collective thoughts and ideas and experiences based on this one very controversial topic and then had a vote based on everyone's voice being heard, but anonymously, right? Because when there is a fear of conflict, you're not going to get everybody's voice heard. I thought it was genius. I really did. So those teams that embrace conflict, right? Healthy conflict, they have more interesting meetings because things are actually going to get worked through. Problems will be solved because people aren't going to be afraid to like engage. They extract ideas of all the team members. So you don't have somebody sitting quietly in the corner. Everyone has a a voice, which is so imperative. And they actually solve problems quicker. And because you're not back channel politics, you're not personal attacking in the hall afterwards, you're not going to say, oh, can you believe this? Right? And so things get done. And boy, anything you can do on a team to minimize the politics right? When people start putting politics in, 
that's when it starts getting personal and it starts getting ugly. And we're not talking about Democrat or Republican politics. We're talking about office politics, which is a whole nother lecture, right? So here's some common responses to conflict. And there are conflict models, right? Win, lose, win, win. Um, I think you guys have probably heard that same model four or five times, um, especially if you're taking the leadership certificate. So I'm not going to go into that one. Um, if you're interested, shoot me an email and I'll send you information on that one. But I think this is kind of more in a team. This relates more in a team. Here's some common respo- responses to conflict. Just straight up avoiding it, right? I'm not going to do it. I'm going to avoid the issue. I'm going to avoid the people. And for these people, it's easier to flight than fight. Um, I When we talk about this in my undergrad ethics class, I always tell the story of my mom. I was a teenager with her, and uh, we were in Kroger back home. And we are, you know, pushing the grocery cart down the aisle. And she sees a, another woman walking toward her, and she turns around and exits the, the aisle. And I said, Mom, what are you doing? We need cereal or whatever it was. And she's like, shut up. Just keep walking. So we walked um, about three more aisles down. My mom parked the the cart and she said, we're out of here. And I said, Mom, we got to get groceries. And she said, nope, I'll come back later. I was like, what is going on? Well, it turned out it was someone she had a personal conflict with and she didn't want to see him at the grocery store. She didn't want to deal with the conflict. So she would just rather abandon the groceries, walk out and come back later. My mother is an avoider. Okay. So what could be problems with avoiders? Well, you avoid it and then something small happens and you combust. Right, you are the literal straw that breaks the camel's back. Something happens and whoo boy, it just kind of all falls to pieces. So those that avoid, you can't avoid forever. That conflict will come back. So you have to be really smart and not avoid it for too long. You've got smoothing. So smoothing is how do we minimize conflict? And there's lots of different ways to smooth conflict. Um, the easiest one and what's interesting in teams, this is the one that they go to most often, is they take a majority vote. That's the smoothing. Oh, well, so if somebody has some different opinions from someone else, let's just take a vote on what we think should happen in majority rules. Well, the majority may not be right, right? Or there may be a vocal minority that is pushing an agenda that no one truly believes in. So smoothing isn't the best way to do it either because it doesn't really get to the heart of the conflict. You may know a forcer (laughs) when it comes to conflict, right? Um, This person is a bully, right? They do whatever it takes, and it may be those back channel politics. It may just be absolute intimidation to accept, um, to have other people accept that your opinion is what it is. And these people are very competitive. It's about winning for them. It's all about winning. Um, I have worked in teams with several bullies and it is just, ugh, right? That person opens their mouth and your stomach just drops because you know that they're just going to be not just an advocate for their position, but they're going to push and not really pull, maybe pull. Um, They're going to bully their way into getting their way and their way may not be the way. You've got some compromising if you're a compromiser. This is that, all right, you've got a point. I'll concede this point, but I've got a point on this other thing. I'm not going to concede that. And so it's a win-win, I guess. When, you know, I'll give a little, you get a little, or really it's lose-lose. Um, in a true neg- negotiation, don't they say that uh, it's considered a good negotiation if everybody walks uh, away a little bit upset um, because everybody lost something? And so it's that idea of uh, giving a little if you give a little. And then problem solving is actually working towards consensus. So finding a path forward that meets everybody's goal, that everyone feels like they had a voice in. Um, That is what they say for long-term team success. Problem solving conflict styles are the best way to do it. So there you go. Um, When you're thinking about your case study for this week, um, 
think about how do you, and I'm going to put up some supplemental uh, resources for conflict. How do you deal with conflict? And then how do teams deal with conflict? And actually having these conversations is really essential um, to say, hey, I'm naturally an avoider. So if I shut down, then you know that I'm angry about something. Right, so letting people know, or um, saying, "Hey, I'm usually a compromiser, or I'm a smoother, and I'll take a vote, or I'll throw in a joke, or I'll do whatever it takes to smooth it over." So, how do you manage group conflict? First of all, anticipate and prevent. Use group member roles, y'all. That's what you do. You say, "You know what? I am this type of person. Maybe I am more task related." Um, I know I have a teammate that is more relationship oriented. I know that that's going to be a problem. We're going to get into some conflict. So if you are proactive in that to say, hey, let's not take this personal, let's not make this personal, then you can actually engage and deal with conflict much better. So think of each problem as a group problem, not an individual problem. It's a we problem, not a me problem. And if you consider that when you're looking at conflict, that's going to help you kind of take a step back and see that bigger picture. I like this one too. Um, neither overreact no, nor underreact. I always think of Michael Scott when he's talking about, um, anyways, sorry, all of my office references. So how do you do that? So neither overreacting nor underreacting. Well, do nothing. Sometimes that's the best thing. Let it sort it out itself. Have an offline conversation with that person, right? Especially if you're an emotional person, this is really hard because in the heat of the moment, you want to go after that person. You want to engage with that person. But sometimes it's best to take a team time out, that do nothing for a second, take a breath, and then meet with that person offline. So give it a little time, then meet with them in their office um, to where it is not... Um, I guess airing your dirty laundry out in the middle of open, if that makes sense. Think about this too. Um, when you are looking at group time, so make it as not personal as possible during conflict. Um, if you know that one of your team members is, let's say, going through a divorce, when you have those first five minutes of a team meeting, you're not going to go around and say, hey, what's the best thing that happened this weekend? Like that's not going to be your opener, icebreaker, right? Well, because their life is kind of going down the toilet. So you say, hey, what's what's the best movie that you've seen in a while? Or does anybody even go to the movies anymore? Right? So you make it about b bigger non-personal things. So that's about honestly being able to read the room and knowing your teammates. Um, offline confrontation, right? Praise in public, criticize in private. And uh, when it comes to the point where you actually need to engage with somebody, don't do it in front of the whole team unless they need to be scolded in front of the whole team because something really, really bad happened. In-group confrontation is when there is a problem between a couple of people or maybe half and half of the team and you got to work it out together so that the story is true. Because if you have those offline confrontations and it doesn't get solved, then you've got one person saying one thing, another person saying another, and those two stories sometimes don't equal, right? Which becomes another problem and causes more conflict. Oh boy. Expulsion. One of, I think, the coolest things I did when I taught the undergrad teams class, and, and I've told you a little bit about this, they had a team project that they had to create. And I gave them some parameters and said, you guys, pick an organization. You guys... Pick your group norms. You guys develop a team contract. And they sign the team, the team contract with their norms and their expectations and their goals. And they came up with their, like, is it one strike and you're out? Or two strikes, you're out? Three strikes, you're out? Sometimes you got to kick a team member out. And it's okay. And in that class, it gave them permission to be like, hey, you're not pulling your weight. We're tired of doing your stuff you gone. And so then it became, they became my problem, um, which became a, a, a big research paper, which nobody really wanted to do. Right. So in the corporate workplace, 
in teams, nonprofit, um, in governmental issues, and even in education, it's harder ugh, in higher education to get rid of somebody on a team, but you can do it, right? So that is worst case scenario. If all else fails, kick them off. We're going to talk about what happens when you work with a jerk and does one bad apple spoil a bunch, um, but get rid of them, right? No, nothing says that you can't go to your boss and say, this person is not working out on this team for personal and professional reasons. We either need to just cut that weight and just do it with this team, or can we have another person, right? Again, last case scenario. All right, looking at lack of commitment. So our next dysfunction, what is that? So looking through... There's two things when it comes to commitment. You need clarity and you need buy-in. So what is clarity? Clarity is this idea of clear goals and objectives. So when you're in that forming stage, this is when you start developing those goals. As you go along, they're going to become a little bit more solidified. If you're working through conflict in order to get to the not only what are we doing, but how are we doing it, if you've got those, then that's going to give you clarity. But then you also need to get buy-in from people. So buy-in is how the with them, like what's in it for me? How can I contribute to this to where I have a personal stake in the goals and objectives? So consensus is one way to do it. True consensus where everybody has a, a voice, everyone has an opinion. It's shared. That doesn't mean that everyone's opinion is taken or we do what everyone says, but everyone at least has a vote to get that buy-in. And clarity and certainty of direction You've got to make sure you have that. You've got to go big or go home, <laughs> basically, um, when it comes to the idea of clarity. So teams that fail to commit, what does that look like? Oh, man. If you don't have clarity, if you don't have buy-in, you're going to have ambiguity among the team about the direction and the priorities. What are we actually doing? Why are we actually doing this? What point is this, right? If you've ever had a team project and, and you feel like that, like, why are we in this committee? What was our charge again? Um, or if you have somebody that tries to take the team in a different direction than maybe what that initial goal is, you can be like, whoo, can we get back to the mission? Can we get back to center? Teams that fail to commit, Oh man, they hash, hash, and rehash again and again and again. I can't tell you how many team meetings I've sat in going, oh Lord, we have talked about this so many times. Like, why do we keep talking about this? Can we not just move forward? Um, sometimes that happens with the change of leadership, right? You get a new leader in, it changes what we think the direction is, and no one knows what that direction is now. Um, sometimes too, on the opposite side, if there's not clarity from the leadership down on what the goals and objectives of the team are, you get the people that have been there forever and they tell you what happened in 1985 and they tell you what happened in 1995 and they tell you what happened in 2005 and you're just like, we get it, like historical things. Um, but it just, they keep having the same discussion over and over. Encourages second guessing among team members, right? So someone says something and they're like, yeah, I don't think that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? So then it becomes this idea of second guessing, which is pretty detrimental to the team. A team that fully commits aligns around the common objectives. Why are we here, right? If you're in the FFA, you know what I'm talking about, right? FFA members, why are we here? You heard those three knocks, everybody stands up and we say why we're here. Like this is the point of what we're doing. So having that, that common objective, having a mission statement, having a vision statement, knowing where we're going so much. So it's so helpful for commitment and buy-in. You learn from the mistakes, right? So you go through conflict, you trust each other. You say, you know what, this is not working out well. How do we need to steer the ship back to center? And then moving forward without hesitation, because you're not afraid of conflict. You're not afraid of, oh, well then, you know, Sally may not like me if I say that. No, like we're going to keep going. We're committed to this one single idea. And you can change directions 
without hesitation or guilt. So if you have something that comes in or an outside force that changes the objective, you can say, all right, this is our new objective. We're going to do this instead. Um, I think back to one of our deans that was really just focused on research in the college, and that was our direction. Then we had another dean come in, and he would say, we're in the people business, right? And so then we kind of had to change direction again and say, all right, so how do we um, get more students instead of how do we get more research dollars? And so so it was a, now we have a new clear vision, let's change direction, let's figure out how this goes, right? So next, avoidance of accountability. We're almost done, y'all. All right, accountability has absolutely become a buzzword. Um, just like leadership, just like I would say diversity, um, all these things that have, no one really truly knows what it means. Right? What is actual accountability? What does that actually mean? Um, so don't make it a buzzword. Here's a great YouTube for that. Um, looking at team dynamics, when we talk about accountability, who's going to be more likely to keep that accountability? Um, look at those group member roles right? Let's look at those norms that we've developed. Do we have a norm and a culture of, of accountability? What does that mean for our team, right? Are we personally accountable? Are we collectively accountable? Um, and what's interesting about this too, just because you're work friends doesn't mean you're going to be good on a team. We see this a lot in undergrads that have group, um, work to do. I love this. Or, you know, friends that decide to live with each other, maybe not the best idea, right? Um, because those personal dynamics come into play and you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. You don't want to say something that you don't, that, that might jeopardize the, the personal relationship outside of the team. Um, I remember having a, a team for that undergrad class that they were all friends outside of of the team project. They actually got to choose their teams that year. And I had one come to me and say, I'm having these problems with my teammates. They're not focused. Um, one that's, it's, he's always late and I'm really getting angry at him, but he's always late to everything we do. So why did I think that he'd be different in a team? But our team contract says that you can't be late, but I don't want to kick him out because he's my buddy. And so we had this really great conversation of when you have to compartmentalize and you have to say, hey, you are still my friend. But right now as a team, your constant lateness is causing us to be unproductive and so we got to hold you accountable. So this is what that looks like, right? So having those crucial conversations in order to increase accountability. So looking at teams that avoid accountability, what does that mean? This creates all sorts of resentment, right? Because if I have a specific standard of performance, I think that if you tell me you're going to get it to me by five, it's in my inbox by five, right? That's my, that, that's what I do. Um, or, oh, you know what, let me, let me put it in this way. If I tell you, get it to me by the end of the day, I personally think that's 5 p.m. Because the end of my work day is 5 p.m. I mean, not really, but you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so if I say, give it to me by the end of the day, and my teammate gives it to me at 11.59 p.m., that's technically at the end of the day. But that's not the, the end, that's not how I define it, right? So you have these different standards, you have these definitions because you're not engaged in healthy conflict, because you don't trust each other, you're automatically assuming the worst, you're not gonna have that really strong accountability. And it absolutely encourages mediocrity. When those goals are not publicized, when the standards are not discussed in the forming stage, it just is, everyone just goes along to get along. And it places the burden on those taking the leadership positions within the team. So it, you know, who's the mother hen of the team? Well, that's the person that usually has to hold other people accountable. And that's not fair, right? That becomes problematic. Teams that uphold accountability ensure poor performers feel pressure to improve or they know that they're getting fired. They're out of the team. So you got to pull your weight in order to be part of this team. 
because of that, you're going to get respect. And you know, you've got trust, you're going through conflict, you're gonna earn respect. And we know that respect is one of the most powerful power bases that we have. So utilizing that instead of coercion is really important. And avoiding excessive bureaucracy. Ugh, right? We we all live and work for a giant bureaucracy and how frustrating that becomes when the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Um, or the fact that someone does something and is not held accountable, but maybe someone further down the food chain or up the food chain is held accountable for this one person's actions, and it just destroys the team dynamic. So you've got to make sure that you, if you've got that accountability, if you've got those standards and goals, you're going to get rid of all that bureaucracy, which is so nice. All right, and attention to results. So here we are, the last stage. What does this mean? So this is when you care about something other than the collective goals of the group. So it's more than just outcome-based performance when it comes to results. Um, results for a team, if you remember, are both production in whatever you're trying to do, hitting those goals and objectives, and also we talked about an effective team as one that works together to get things done. So sometimes this looks like team status and being part of the group is sometimes that's the end result, right? That's more than outcomes based. Um, if you have an individual status, the focus is more on yourself and not on the team, then that's going to be problematic when it comes to those results. So teams that are not results focus, they stagnate. They don't go through the whole team development process. They're not working together. They're very stagnant. They rarely defeat competitors. So if competition is one of your strengths, if that's one of the things you do, working together as a team is going to get you better results. Therefore, your results are going to be awesome and you're going to kick the butt of your competitor. Okay, so sometimes for an individualistic person, they have to think about shucking their own ego at the door in order to get that bigger win. And teams that are not results focused don't do that. They lose their achievement orientation. They get lost in the weeds. Heck, they're probably still lost in that conflict se section. So collective results, again, minimalizing that individualistic behavior. It's all about we, it's not about me. And they enjoy that success together. Once they get to the performing and adjourning stages, they're doing it together. So moving through storming in order to get to those really productive in a specific way processes part of the team is really important and you avoid distractions when you've got that collective result because you've already moved through these other dysfunctions so again looking at these dysfunctions these are the pitfalls you do not want your team to engage in and all of these have to do with storming because if you don't have that trust it's going to lead to the fear of conflict if you're not willing to engage in those hard conversations then you're going to get people piecing out they don't want to be part of the team anymore so when you have that that means that they are not doing their job they're avoiding the accountability of being a good teammate and that means that your results will not be hit. So it's going to collapse on itself. So do not fall prey to the five dysfunctions of a team. Work through them. If you get anything from the storming section of this module, it's you gotta do the work. And working through conflict is not easy, but it's essential for a team. All right, till next time.